We're in the Gospel of John this morning. We're going to continue our study in the Gospel of John. If you've been with us for a while, you know that here we love to go book by book, chapter by chapter, and just study um, passages of Scripture together. So we've been in the Gospel of John for a while, and we will continue to be in the Gospel of John for a while. But we're looking at each story, and we're trying to see what does this passage teach us specifically about Jesus? What is this passage telling us about who Jesus is? And my prayer is that as you see Jesus in this passage, you would be more in awe and more in worship of Jesus. And the story that we're learning this morning, that we're studying this morning, is one of the most powerful stories in Scripture. It's a story of a man that's been dead for four days, and Jesus resurrects him from the dead. So John 11, we're going to be looking at the story of Jesus and Lazarus. You know, we all live in a me-centered world, right? In a self-centered world. We, it is always about us. And this starts even for us as a young baby. You have, babies have no sense of otherness. They're not looking to serve you, um, but they want everything from you, right? Uh, as a child, as a baby, our, their world, they're in the center of it. Our world revolves around them and what they want, right? Feed me, change me, um, make me happy, stop making me crying, make me content, right? And you just live in their world. You're just somewhere there. They pretty much think, well, at least my kids do, that I exist for their sake, that I'm there to give them whatever they want. And the sad thing is, it doesn't change as we get older. Over time, we learn and we feel intuitively that we really want to do what's best for us, even if it is to the determinant of others. We then pursue self-interest and overly become self-reliant and self-focused. It's the plague of our culture. St. Augustine would say that this is a fitting description of sin. He believed that sin was like the bending of our soul's energy away from a giving God and God's glory to us so that the focus is now on us and what we want and seeking our own glory. And yet, even when we become followers of Jesus, even when we pursue Jesus, we become Christians, and you start loving and following Jesus, that bent is still there, right? You still want what's best for you. You still want life to revolve around you. Paul calls this our flesh. So now, it's like a little baby who's crying out to their parents, feed me, satisfy me. We turn to God and we say, feed me, bless me, give me. Make my life easier. Fix me, right? I mean, now, God, our lives still are in the center, and other people fit into it. They are, their lives revolve around us, and now God revolves around us. But the reality of the universe is that we live not in a me-centered universe, but a radically God-centered universe. God created the universe and designed it so that it would talk about Him, not about us. And you and I, as human beings, we are the pinnacle of God's creation. We are created for the exact same thing, to display and show forth the glory of God. See, this is what makes sin not just selfish and glory-stealing, but this is what makes sin self-destructive. If you've been in this series, you've heard me say over and over that sin makes us stupid. It makes us dumb. We are designed to live not man-centered lives, but God-centered lives. Isaiah, God would speak in the book of Isaiah, he'd say, I created everyone for my glory. See, that's an entirely different worldview than what we're bent towards, than the one that we find ourselves living in daily. So there's no wonder that we struggle so much in this world, so much with this thing called suffering. Why do we suffer? I said earlier, the plague of our culture is self-centeredness. But the world would say that the plague of the world is suffering. They say that's why there's so much Christians. If the world is about us, then we default, when we think about suffering, through one of two systems. There's always a merit system. If we feel like we've been living right and doing good things and um, following law and following scripture, when we suffer, we say, this is not fair. Or we say that God is not being right to me, or I don't deserve this. God, I am obeying you, I am following you, why are you making me suffer, right? So it's like, God, look at all the good things I do. 
I don't deserve this. Or, on the flip side of that, if we're not living right, if we are disobeying Jesus, then we say things like, I deserve this. God is out to get me because I'm not pursuing him, right? We need a worldview when it comes to interpreting our circumstances, our pain, our suffering. So how do we think through this? How, what is God up to in suffering? How does the glory of Jesus seen in his resurrection empower us to be God-centered instead of self-centered in the midst of suffering and pain and hardship? In John 11, we're going to see Jesus do some pretty radical things. We're going to see him say some pretty incredible things, things that we're not comfortable with. Now I want you to pray that Jesus will give you a pliable spirit this morning, a teachable heart, as we look at what Jesus says about suffering and what he does and what he doesn't do when suffering occurs. So I'm going to approach this text a little differently. Normally I'll give you like three, four, maybe five points. Um, you're not going to get points in the beginning. We're going to go through the passage, and at the end I'm going to give you some application. So we're going to go from verse 1. We're going to go all the way down to verse 44. So you better have drunk your coffee, drank your coffee this morning. So 1 to verse 44. Let's look at verse 1. Now a certain man was ill, Lazarus of Bethany, the village of Mary and her sister Martha. It was Mary who anointed the Lord with ointment and wiped his feet with her hair whose brother Lazarus was ill. Notice right up front in this story, as the characters are being brought onto the stage, as the characters are being introduced, that John calls Lazarus a certain man. This, this guy that happens to live in Bethany, in verse 39, when we get to there, in verse 39, it says he's a dead man. Why? Because John is making sure that you and I understand that this story isn't about Lazarus at all. This story is about Jesus. And this is where we need that role to shift. He is preparing and showing us right up front from ver verse 1 that the world is not about us, but it's about Jesus. Lazarus is just a certain man, and then he became a dead man, who Jesus happened to raise from the dead. All the arrows in the story point not to Lazarus, but to Jesus. This is the first mention of this family, Mary, Martha, Lazarus, and the Gospel of John. Jesus meets them over in Luke chapter 10. That's the first time Jesus is, meets them. And these three are siblings. They're brothers, sisters, and Jesus knows them well. In fact, their home becomes almost like a home base for Jesus, where he goes, where he rests. These are not just random people that Jesus happens to meet. This is not the story of the Roman officer who just randomly comes and says, hey, heal my son. Jesus knows this family. He loves this family. And that's very important to understand as we approach this text. This is a family that's close to the heart of Jesus. Verse 3. So the sister said to him, saying, Lord, he whom you love is ill. But when Jesus heard it, he said, this illness does not lead to death. It is for the glory of God. So the Son of God may be glorified through it. So the sisters are staying with their sick brother. They're taking care of their brother. They send messengers to Jesus. It probably would have taken about two days for these messengers to get to Jesus. They no doubt thought, if, man, if only Jesus was here. If only Jesus was around. If only Jesus was available. They probably was sitting there in their home assuring Lazarus, hey Lazarus, we're really good friends with Jesus. He's close to us. He's dear to us. He'll be here soon. And he'll, or... Like that Roman centurion's son, he'll just send a word. And pretty soon, before our messengers get back, you'll be healed. If he could do it for a Gentile who doesn't follow Jesus, surely he'll do it for someone, for someone who loves, right? You're going to pull through, Lazarus. Jesus is going to heal you. That can be a word of warning. Beware of presuming to know the will of God for someone that is not in Scripture. Beware of presuming to know the will of God for someone that's not in Scripture. Just because Jesus heals someone one way, He's not obligated to do it for you the exact same way. Just because Jesus has provided for someone one way, doesn't mean that He is obligated to provide for you the same way. He knows what's best for each of us, and He gives us what we need. And notice how tight the friendship is between Jesus and Lazarus. They don't even need to mention Lazarus' name. They just say, hey, Jesus, the one that you love. Don't miss an important point here. People whom Jesus loves get sick. 
people whom Jesus loves suffers people whom Jesus loves dies now do you know that but we need to be reminded of that because oftentimes we think God I pursue you I love you nothing bad should ever happen and the story teaches us just because you're a follower of Jesus doesn't mean that you're now immune, like you have this force field around you that nothing can happen to you. Now what words come out of your mouth if you hear a good friend or a relative is dying? You might say things like, oh no, what's going on? What happened? How can I help? And you would think that Jesus would immediately make sure the road from where he is to Bethany would be completely clear, that there would be no distractions, and he would get there as quickly as possible. But Jesus doesn't do that. Instead, he basically says, ah, not a big deal. It's okay. He's not going to die. But the reason his sister sent for him was because Lazarus was on the brink of death. What is going on here? Was Jesus just being lazy? Did he not love them? Did he not know the condition of man? Did he not know that because of sin, that is the end all for all of us? And Jesus gives us a brief and what might be an overly spiritual answer. He says the reason Lazarus, whom he loves, is sick is because God's going to get glory. <laughs> an overly spiritual answer. Can you imagine running to someone and saying to your and saying to your friend or your spouse that, hey, we're sick, or something's going on, or their child is dying, and you respond and say, ah, it's okay, it's for God's glory. Right? That would question their compassion, their empathy, and that would, might be a reason to befriend them from Facebook. Right? I mean, that's, you don't want to associate with people like that. But we know that Jesus is full of compassion. We know that Jesus is full of empathy. We saw this in our text last week, that Jesus is relentlessly pursuing his children. So what does Jesus mean by this statement that it's for God's glory? It means that he's been ordained so that Jesus would be, that this incident has been ordained so that Jesus would be made much of. That he would be magnified. Not like a microscope, but like a telescope. A microscope takes something that's small and makes it bigger. God does not ordain this so that Jesus, who is tiny and teeny, might be, might, make, might be made to look bigger than he really is. But it's like a telescope that takes something that's huge and brings it into perspective. God is ordaining this situation so that people, including you and I this morning, might get a glimpse of just how powerful and glorious Jesus really is. You see, God ordains joy and God ordains suffering all for this purpose. The worst life. Now Jesus loved Martha and her sister and Lazarus. Now just as Jesus says that this happens so that God would be glorified, we see his love affirmed again for them. Jesus wants his disciples to know how much he really loves this family. So he gets the news that Lazarus is dying, which by now is two days old, because that's how long it took the messengers to get to Jesus. And then he talks about how deep of love that he has for this family. And if you were one of his disciples, as soon as you heard the news, you were probably packing your stuff up, putting your tent back together, and put, making sure you have enough food for that two-day journey, because you would immediately think, because of the love that Jesus has for this family, that Jesus was moving right away. Verse 6. And when he heard that Lazarus was ill, he stayed two days longer in the place where he was. And then after, he, after this, he said to his disciples, let's go to Judea again. Notice what Jesus does with the news. He stays two days longer in the wilderness. He doesn't immediately start moving. He stays put. He stays there for two days. He doesn't go and relieve the suffering of Lazarus and his sisters. Lazarus is sick and he dies. His sisters' hearts are pounding. And yet Jesus does nothing. Let me remind you, Lazarus isn't lying by the Sea of Galilee with a band-aid over a wound. He's probably in the equivalent of a hospital bill, and a hospital bed in agony as his sisters wouldn't have called Jesus because they knew that if Jesus came back, he was risking his life because there was people in that city that wanted Jesus dead. Imagine the sisters going out hour by hour looking. Is Jesus on his way? Is Jesus coming close? never to find him as Lazarus' wife fizzles away. Jesus gets the news of Lazarus of, um, approaching death. He affirms his love for his family and he stays put the rest of the day. 
And in the morning you think they start moving, but they stay put another day in the wilderness. And finally, on the third day, Jesus finally tells his disciples, hey, let's go. Jesus was determined that the greatest display of his glory would not be in the healing of the sick man, but in the raising of the dead man. And so he waits. And now, we have what seems to be contradictory in our minds. Jesus loves us, and yet he ordains pain and suffering. And also what Jesus does to be made much of, to be magnified, at the same time is most loving and what is to our greatest benefit and joy. So what Jesus does for his glory, he does for our good. Verse 8, the disciples said to him, Rabbi, the Jews were just now seeking to stone you, and you're going there again? You're going back to the place where they want to kill you? And the disciples, basically, they're saying, what's the point now? Lazarus is dead. Why are you going to risk your life now? There's no point in going back. He's already dead. Notice the risk that Jesus is taking to go back to the suburbs of Jerusalem. He risks his life to go see Lazarus and his sisters. And you say, that's nice that he risked his life to go to Lazarus' funeral, but why couldn't he go and kill him when he was sick? Verse 9. Jesus answers, are there not 12 hours in a day? If anyone walks in the day, he does not stumble, because he sees the light of this world. But if anyone walks in the night, he stumbles because the light is not in him. So Jesus gives this little parable now to illustrate that he knew exactly what time it is and that he is in complete control. As he said back in chapter 10, he says, no one can take my life. I lay it down on my own. Jesus is the light of the world and he says that no one is going to set a trap for him that he won't, will not see. He says, I'm going to be all right, guys. Listen, no precautionary measures which the disciples will make to lengthen Jesus' time, and no evil plan by the religious leaders is going to shorten Jesus' time. The Father has decreed a perfect plan with perfect precision, precision timing. So we see Jesus affirming over and over that he is absolutely sovereign and in control, and we also see that he capitally loves Lazarus and his sisters Absolute love, complete sovereignty, and overwhelming tragedy collide, and it creates all sorts of confusion. Verse 11. After saying these things to him, after saying these things, he said to them, Our friend Lazarus has fallen asleep, but I go to awaken him. The disciples said to him, Lord, if he's fallen asleep, he'll recover. Now Jesus was speaking of his death, but they thought that he was taking rest and sleep. So Jesus tells them plainly, Lazarus must die. Jesus tells them something that only he knows as God. This wasn't a guess. This was certainty, right? He knew Lazarus had died, not because he got a text message or a notification on his phone. There was no carrier pigeons. There was no Pony Express. There was no way Jesus would have known that Lazarus was dead, but the fact that he was God. Go down to verse 17. Now when Jesus came, he found that Lazarus had already been in the tomb for four days. Bethany was near Jerusalem, about two miles off, and many of the Jews had come to Martha and Mary to console them concerning their brothers. So we find that by the time Jesus finally comes to Bethany, Lazarus had been flatlined for four days now. That means the sisters were right when they said that Lazarus is dying. It took two days for messengers to get to Jesus, and if Jesus had left immediately, he would have gotten there before Lazarus died. Lazarus died about the day Jesus decided to start the journey back to Bethany. Now notice there's a crowd there. What's going on with this crowd? It's at least three days since the funeral happened. So why are people still there? As many, in Jewish culture, as many people possible attended a funeral. Everyone who could was supposed to join in the procession along the way. Deep mourning lasted for seven days, of which the first three days was for weeping. And during those days, it was forbidden, the first three days, to wash, to put on shoes, to engage in any study or any business. The seven days was followed by 30 days of lighter mourning. According to Jewish custom, even the poorest of families was expected to hire two flute players and professional wailing women. <laughs> these professional, these wailing women, would, um, they would begin to wail as soon as a new guest would arrive in the house. They also, had, if they had time, would learn about the deceased 
so that they could converse with the guests that got there. And then there were flute players. The music of the flute was associated with death in those days. Probably I'm making my daughter learn flute right now. Um, death music, right? Um, and so this house was in a pandemonium. It was loud, it was noisy. Anytime someone new walked in, these women just would start yelling and screaming and wailing. Verse 20. Martha heard that Jesus was coming. She went and met him. But Mary remained seated in the house. Martha said to Jesus, Lord, if you've been here, my brother would not have died. But now I know that whatever you ask from God, I will give you. Martha caught wind that Jesus was coming. That he was a distance off. And she pulls herself together as quickly as possible. No doubt confused, no doubt maybe even angry and questioning. And she goes out and meets Jesus along the way. And here's what's beautiful in Martha. We see faith and grief mingled together. We see faith and mingled. Faith and grief mingled together. You ever feel that way sometimes? God, you are absolutely powerful, you're absolutely good, but yet... Why do I suffer? God, where were you when my marriage dissolved? God, where were you when my parents divorced? God, where were you when I got fired from a job that I didn't deserve to get fired from? God, where were you when my health deteriorated? God, where were you when my kids were sick? We know that you're omnipotent, that you can do whatever you want, that you can alleviate alleviate pain, that you can alleviate suffering, that you can stop any temptation that comes into my life. But why don't you show up when I need you? That's what Martha's feeling. God, I know you're powerful. But where were you when I need you? And notice, here's what I love about Jesus in this passage. He doesn't rebuke her. He doesn't condemn her. He doesn't say, stop doubting. It's not sinful to tell God how you feel. It's not sinful for you to say, God... I'm angry, I'm frustrated, I'm wondering where you are. That's okay. God longs for whatever lies at the depths of our soul. But as soon as she expresses how she feels, she also reaffirms her faith in Jesus. Jesus, I don't know why you didn't come sooner, but I know that you can take this mess and somehow use it for your glory. That you can do something with this. Verse 23. Jesus said to her, Your brother will rise again. Martha said to him, I know that he will rise again in the resurrection on the last day. Jesus says, hey, this is what I'm about to do. I'm going to raise him from the dead. And Martha interprets it as saying, hey, Lazarus is going to rise on that day when all the saints are resurrected. You see, the saints of the Old Testament believed that there was going to be a resurrection. Psalm 16, Job 19, Daniel 12 talks about resurrection. That wasn't a new thing that came in the New Testament. So Martha says, yeah, Jesus, I've been to synagogue. I've taken theology courses. I know that Lazarus is going to rise again. I know that for sure. And Jesus says in verse 25, I am the resurrection and the life. I am the resurrection and the life. Jesus helps Martha understand that he's not talking about the last days, but he's talking about here and now. And he's saying that all that she understands about the resurrection, all that she understands about a future event is wrapped up in him. He is the resurrection, not just someone that can resurrect other people from the dead. He himself is the resurrection. Resurrection is death brought back to life. And Jesus is about to do that, and he's about to be that himself. Paul would say in 1 Corinthians that Jesus will be the first fruit of the resurrection. His resurrection will secure ours by faith in him. And he would go into death, and he would come out on the other side victorious, and he will invite us to come through as well. Verse 25. Whoever believes in me, even though he dies, yet he shall live. And everyone who lives and believes in me shall never die. Do you believe this, Martha? She said to him, Yes, Lord. I believe that you are the Christ, the Son of God, who is coming into the world. Jesus again clarifies that death is just like sleep. Death is simply the separation of the body from the soul temporarily. You go on living. There is a first and a second death. You learn about this in Revelation 20. If you know Jesus, if you're a follower of Jesus, you only die once. 
your body leaves your soul. But if you don't know Jesus, you die twice. You lose your body leaves your soul, and you lose the death from your soul from Jesus. Those who believe in Jesus will, in essence, never die. They will never be separated from Him. Eternal life starts the moment you believe, which is why Jesus would say in John 17 that He already gave it to them. Verse 28. When she had said this, she went and called her sister Mary, saying in private, The teacher is here and calling for you. And when she heard it, she rose quickly and went to him. Now Jesus had not yet come into the village, but was still in the place where Martha had met him. And when the Jews who were with her in the house, cons consoling her, saw Mary rise quickly and go out, they followed her, supposing that she was going to the tomb to weep there. And now Mary enters the scene. The family, the friends, and all the flute players of death and the women of hysteria all follow Mary, and they think they follow Mary to the tomb. She must have seemed distraught and in tears, for this word for going for weep was more like wailing and, shriek, and shrieking. It was the same with the crowd, verse 32. And when Mary came to where Jesus was and saw him, she fell at his feet, saying to him, Lord, if you had been here, if you would have been here, my brother would not have died. And when Jesus saw her weeping and saw the Jews who had come with her weeping, he was deeply moved in his spirit and greatly troubled. Jesus surveys the situation, sees everyone broken, humanity weeping in pain and sorrow. Mary breaks out in tears, and everyone is looking at Jesus with uncertainty. Why did he come sooner? Why was he so busy for his friends? Why did he let this happen? And the idea of the language is that Jesus groans from being distraught and being angry. These are angry, sorrowful tears. Is Jesus angry at the crowd? Is he angry at Mary? No. He's angry at death. Jesus is no more happy with the way things are than we are. He doesn't like it any more than we do, which is why he has been healing people throughout the book of John and redeeming us from the effects of sin. Jesus is angry at death. He isn't saying, it's okay, guys. I'll fix them up in a jiffy. Don't overreact. That's not what he's saying. No, Jesus is mad at death, and we should be as well. When Jesus saw death, he was looking right in the face of his enemy. He's looking at the one that he came to conquer, the one we brought to life with our sin. Death is not the way things are supposed to be. Death, brokenness, sorrow, pain, injustice should make us all angry at sin. And not just sin that's out there, but that sin that's in us. We're all contributors today to the fallenness of our world. None of us are innocent when death occurs because we've all contributed to it. So why is Jesus furious? Didn't he know that Lazarus was going to die? Didn't he know that the sisters were going to be distraught? Does, does it even matter, Jesus? Even though all of this was a part of his sovereign plan, human suffering still affects God. Listen, the God that we serve is not cold and callous to suffering, even though he ordains it. One thing that we can be certain of is that when suffering happens, it can't be because he doesn't care or because he doesn't love us. He proves that on the cross, how much he loves and cares for us. Verse 34. And he said, where? And he laid him. And they said to him, come and see. Verse 35. Jesus. Jesus is now moved to action. He wants to know where Lazarus is located. He breaks into Jesus weeps with those who weep. The God of the universe is in tears when suffering occurs, and yet he is in complete control of the situation. Verse 31, when we talk about angry wailing, is a result of the sorrow of loss, of pain. But here in verse 35, it's tears of sympathy and love and compassion. It is words for tears running down the face of Jesus the amazing truth of the incarnation of the Son of God is that God now has tear ducts that really flow at the sight of loss. Verse 36. 
So the Jews said, see how much he loved them. But some of them said, could not he open the eyes of the blind man? Who also have kept this man from dying. So here, already in this passage, we've seen John tells us that Jesus loves Lazarus so much. Martha saying that Jesus loves Lazarus. Jesus displaying it and the clouds observing it. But they all have the exact same question. God, Jesus, didn't you have the power to stop this? You made blind men see. Why couldn't you heal Lazarus? And the answer is, yeah, he has power, but he didn't. And this is what boggles their mind and confuses their soul. Verse 38. Then Jesus, deeply moved again, came to the tomb. It was a cave, and a stone lay against it. Jesus tells us, that it, John tells us that it was a cave which is a common means of burial back in those days. The tomb was either in a narrow cave or in a, in a hole that was mm, stuck out of a rock. This was a, there was a chamber inside, usually about six feet long, three feet wide, ten feet high. And there were usually eight shelves in this cave, three on one side, three on the other, and then two all the way in the back, opposite the entrance. And in those shelves, bodies were laid. The bodies were enveloped in linen, but the hands and feet were wrapped in bandage-like wrappings, and the head was covered, was wrapped separately. The tomb had no door, so a rock was always rolled in front of it. And here we see Jesus again, deeply moved. His angry tears have not subsided. Jesus is again staring at his enemy death, and he's ready to go into the ring and fight this battle. And Jesus advances to the tomb of Lazarus like a champion prepared for battle. Verse 39, Jesus says, Take away the stone. Martha, the sister of the dead man, said to him, Lord, by this time there will be an order, for he has been dead for four days. Jesus tells the funeral home attendants with authority, Hey, move that stone. And Martha chimes in and makes sure Jesus knows what he's talking about. Lazarus has been dead four days. It's going to stink. King James Version says it's stinking. Right? The body has started to decompose at this point. The bacteria which is breaking down is causing gases like hydrogen sulfide and methane to release and also causing the body to swell. Maggots from flies and hats, other insects have entered the body. The corpse is not a pretty picture and Martha's saying, you don't want to go in there. Verse 40. Jesus said to her, Did I not tell you that if you believed, you would see the glory of God? So they took away the stone. Jesus lifted up his eyes and said, Father, I thank you that you've heard me. I knew that you always hear me, but I said this on account of the people standing around, that they may also believe that you sent me. Jesus reminds Martha of what he said. He equates the resurrection with the glory of God. Seeing the glory of God is why Jesus allowed this to happen in the first place, he says. And letting it go on for four days assures the fact that Lazarus is not asleep or in a coma, but he is dead, so the crowds will have no doubt what's going on here. Verse 23. When he said these things, he cried out with a loud voice, Lazarus, come out. The man who had died came out his hand, his feet bound with linen strips, his face wrapped up with a cloth. And Jesus said to them, Unbind him and let him go. He tells Lazarus, Come out. And Lazarus comes out immediately. There's no delay. The idea of the language is, Lazarus come out, it's almost like a master calling his dog, Cheer Boy. And Lazarus just shows up. He gets out of the cave as fast as he can. His body has been made whole. And Jesus tells him, unbind him. Let him go. He's alive. So what's the point of suffering? What is the paradigm that we can use to think through and, sh- and sit through all of our troubles? How do we address suffering? Let me give you three things. Number one, your suffering is for the glory of God. Your suffering is for the glory of God. And that's very clear in this passage. Jesus states it plainly over and over. But what do we mean by the glory of God? It means that this miracle showed the value, the worth, the beauty of Jesus. It put Jesus on display. How? 
Because in this miracle, we see the love and compassion of Jesus displayed in how he weeps with the family and how he raises Lazarus. We see his absolute sovereignty in not only having power over death, but in having complete control over the situation. And we see his redemptive work, for in just a few months, Jesus would himself rise from the dead. Lazarus rose with a mortal, corruptible body that would one day die again, but Jesus rose as the conqueror of death who would never die again. And because of his resurrection, all believers, including you and I, will one day receive bodies that will never die. Remember I said in the beginning that we live in a me-centered world? But we don't. We live, we live in a God-centered world. Everything that God does is ultimately to glorify himself and make himself known in the world. There is coming a day, according to Habakkuk 2, where the earth will be filled with the knowledge of the glory of God as the waters cover the sea. Right now, we don't see it as we should. We don't look closely enough. We just moan and complain about life instead of seeing that God, even in this situation, you can be born. Number two, your suffering is for your joy and good. Your suffering is for your joy and good. Jesus brings suffering in order to show you his glory so that you will be more satisfied in his life. In other words, it is for his, it's because of his love for you. But how, is the, but how is the display of his glory really loving to Lazarus? How can God's self-exaltation be loved toward you? See, if I exalt myself, if I talk about myself, you would look at me and say, you're arrogant, you're prideful, and rightfully so. No one would call that love for others, but just love for myself. So how is God different? See, we redefine love in our me-centered world. We think it's about making much of us. Tell me how good I am. Talk about, how, talk about my skills. Talk about me. Talk about my abilities, and I'll be happy. Like me on Facebook. Follow me on Twitter. Like my Instagram photos. But that's not love. John Piper says it this way, love is not making much of someone, but in doing whatever you have to do at great cost to yourself so they will be satisfied eternally but what is eternally satisfying? Really, <coughs> God. Love is doing whatever you have to do in order to enthrall someone with that which will make them happy forever and it isn't a mirror. Listen, you weren't made for mirrors, you were made for the glory of God. You know that your deepest, highest, most lasting moments of joy are moments of self-forgetfulness when you either see or hear or smell or taste something so amazing that in that moment you completely forget about yourself. You're captured in whatever you see. Jesus is the ultimate means of self-forgetfulness because everything you experience causes you to forget that you are just samples or taste or apps or clips or vines or gifs for the real thing which is Jesus, that you are made for Jesus. So that in order for God to love you, he must satisfy you completely. If he doesn't give you that which is most satisfying, then he doesn't love you. What is most satisfying? to see, to know, to love Jesus. He is the only being in the universe whose self-exaltation is the greatest act of love toward us. Therefore, God sends suffering into our lives so that Jesus might be put on display in order that we might be more satisfied in him. Finally, your suffering is, is for the joy and good of others. Your suffering is for the joy and good of others. As a result of Lazarus' suffering, his own life was impacted, so was the life of his sisters and the life of the crowd. Look at these guys. Mary and Martha. The suffering turns Mary into a sacrificial servant. The suffering turns Martha, um, Martha into a sacrificial servant. The suffering turns Mary into a passionate worshiper of Jesus. Their time, their money, their energy become nothing to them. They spend it all for Jesus after this, after what happens with Lazarus. In John 12, which we're going to look at in a few weeks, here's what we read. In the beginning, it says, Six days before the Passover, Jesus therefore came to Bethany where Lazarus was, whom Jesus raised from the dead, and they gave a dinner for him there. Martha served, Lazarus was the one, reclining with him at the table. Mary therefore took a pound of expensive ointment made. 
from pure nard, and anointed the feet of Jesus, wiped his feet with her hair. The house was filled with the fragrance of the perfume. See, when, it, when you go through suffering, it transforms you into a person of sacrifice and service to others, especially for those who suffer. You become a more gracious person, a more giving person. So Corinthians says it this way, Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. Christ, the God of mercy, the God of all comfort, who comforts us in our affliction, so that we may be able to comfort those who are in any affliction with the comfort with which we ourselves are comforted by God. For as we share abundantly in Christ's suffering, so through Christ we share abundantly in comfort also. If we are afflicted, it is for your comfort. That's the impact that Jesus had on Mary and Martha, but look at Lazarus. It set his heart on fire for mission. And it set his heart on fire so that people would see Jesus because of his suffering. He becomes such an instrumental part of the mission of God that the religious leaders now try to kill Lazarus. John 12, 10. So the chief priests made plans to put Lazarus to death as well because on account of him, many of the Jews were going away and believing in Jesus. We know this personal life. Suffering makes, molds us and makes us into people we otherwise would not be. The person of Lazarus was completely transformed through suffering. Listen, if you want to be part of the advancement of the kingdom of God, if you want to see the gospel go forward, if you want to join with Jesus on mission, then just know that God will bring suffering to make that happen. This is why Jesus would say over and over in the gospels that you would have to take up your cross and follow him. We go Piper again. Suffering was not just a consequence of Jesus' obedience and mission. It was the central strategy of the mission. It was the way that he accomplished our salvation. Jesus called us to join him on the Calvary Road to take up our crosses and to fall on the ground like a seed and die so that others may live. Friends, nothing lasts. Nothing. <coughs> it's all the way, but nothing that lasts, nothing of eternal consequence will occur through you without suffering. And even though we try to pad up our life, try to make it safe, and try to make it easy, just know that if that is your goal, you're going to stand before Jesus one day empty handed because you carry the bedazzled cross instead of an old one. Look at the effect that this suffering had on the crowds. As a result of Lazarus' suffering, our text says that many people came to believe in Jesus. The suffering of Lazarus and the subsequent resurrection caused people to turn to Jesus. It wasn't just what Jesus did in Lazarus through suffering to send him on mission. It was actual suffering that caused people to come to Jesus. Verse 45 to John 11 so that many of the Jews, therefore, had come with Mary and had seen what he did, they believed in him. Jesus is bringing you through suffering for his name's sake, so that your joy would increase and for the good of others. He might be bringing you through suffering for those same purposes. If you're here this morning and you're going through suffering, I encourage you, look, for how God is making himself known in the world. Look for how he is seeking to increase your joy and, and look for how he is opening doors for the gospel to be preached through your life. You said, wait a minute, that's so much easier said than done. Where does that power come from to believe such things? How do I get that power to believe that God can use me in the midst of suffering? How do, why do we falter so much and waver in faith when suffering does come, why do we question when suffering does happen? The answer is because we're still unsure whether Jesus loves us. We're still unsure if Jesus actually understands us. We're still unsure if Jesus actually sees. If brothers, sisters, the resurrection of Jesus assures us that he understands, that he sees, that he loves. Back in John 11.35, that's the smallest verse in Scripture, but one of the most powerful verses, it says Jesus wept. 
That word for weeping is only used in Scripture two more times. And both times is in the book of Revelation. Revelation 7, catch this, says, The Lamb is in the midst of the throne and will be their shepherd. And he will guide them to springs of living water, and God will wipe every tear from their eyes. The only other time it's used in Scripture is in Revelation 21. It says, He will wipe every tear from their eye, and death shall be no more. Neither shall there be mourning, nor crying, nor pain anymore, for the former things passed away. My friends, Jesus was a man full of tears in this story, a man of sorrow, acquainted with grief. He cried tears of redemption for you on that cross so that one day his nail-pierced hand can wipe every tear from your eye forever and ever. And the reason he can do that, do that one day, is because he has punched death in the face. He conquered the grave and he rose again. Jesus is the resurrection. As we go to communion this morning, and I invite you to respond to Jesus. Some of you this morning need to take up a different cross than the one you've been carrying. Your cross is not the cross of Jesus. It's the cross of wanting comfort and safety and security. And any time something different happens, you're like, God, this is not what I signed up for. And this morning... Jesus is calling you to lay down whatever you're carrying and take up his cross to follow him. Some of you in this room might need to take up the cross for the first time and come to Jesus. You might have been coming to church for a long, long time, but you were just really here because what was in it for me? What can Jesus give me? How can Jesus make me happy? And this morning, Jesus is calling you to lay down, to pick up, to pick up that cross to follow him. Others of you might just need to weep and cry out over your pain and suffering and acknowledge God. I've made it all about me instead of about you. That it's my world is centered around myself and I have not seen how this can bring glory and honor to you, God. In the midst of my pain, I know you weep with me, I know you cry with me, but I know you can take this mess, this struggle, this pain, this hardship, this difficulty, and God, you can use it where in and through my life, in and through this experience, and in and through this trial, you can be glorified, and it will be for your glory, it will be for my good. Some of you just need to say, God, take it, use it, be honored with it. I don't know where you are this morning, but I invite you to respond to Jesus whatever he's calling you this morning. This morning, if you need prayer, there are people in the back of this room that are available to pray for you. So before you come to communion, and if you want someone to pray with you, would you just go, would you be prayed for, and then you are welcome to come and grab elements from communion. These, this table, these tables here are meant for the means to worship this morning. There's bread there, there's juice there. When you are ready, you can come and you can take the elements the elements that give us a tangible reminder this morning of what Jesus went through in crying tears of redemption for us. But the bread and the juice isn't just a reminder of what happened in the past. It's also a reminder that it's a sign of hope for a coming day. Because of what Jesus did, there is hope that there will be a day that he will wipe every tear from our eyes forever. That we can have hope. That we can be people that no matter what we go through, no matter what we experience, that because Jesus has punched death in the face and conquered it, that we can have hope. That no matter what we are going through this week, no matter what we're going through in our lives, we can know that, it is, that he is in control, that his hand is on us, that we are in the palm of his hands, that he will never let us come. So this morning as you come and invite you to examine, would you come to Jesus? Would you respond to Jesus? And then when you're ready, any time you're ready as you worship Jesus, would you come, grab the elements, and be reminded of his faithfulness and goodness to you, no matter where you are in life this morning. Let's worship Jesus.